So good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our sixth webinar from the East Sussex I Group. It's great to have you with us once again. As usual, we are recording this webinar and it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel, the East Sussex I Group. So there is one CET point available for optometrists and dispensing opticians. That is if you're watching it live and have used the link to join and I will upload the CET points this weekend. As usual, the lecture will run for about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes or so for questions at the end. So at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, please type them into there. And at the end of the, the webinar, we will then try and get through as many as we can. So today I would like to welcome, to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Sharam Kashani. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex Healthcare Trust, specializing in the management of complex medical retinal disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as high volume cataract surgeries. He has previously been the clinical lead for East Sussex NHS Trust and is now the head of retinal services and uveitis. Tonight, he will present to us a webinar on cataracts, the pitfalls, considerations, and local policies. So I'd like to hand over to Mr. Kashani. Thank you, Ian, as always, for organizing and uh, being brilliant with all these things. Uh, now I shall put that away so it goes away. Good. Um, thank you all for um, attending and giving up on your um, <clears throat> evening to um, listen to this talk. Um, I like some of the other talks, actually. I had to do this one from uh, the beginning. So it, it's taken me quite a while to put it together. But actually, whilst doing it, it made me think quite a lot about things that you don't normally think about when you see patients with cash racks. So I'd like to share some of these things with you. So I think we all know each other. Uh, well, you all know who I am. Um, and uh, we can move on to the next slide. So the topics covered are, what is a cataract um, classification and presentation? What preoperative considerations there may be? Talk a little bit about the procedure and target refraction. At the end of the talk, there will be a video, uh, which I have tried to um, do on iMovie. So please excuse the, um, uh, the way the video is together, but hopefully you get a gist of what cataract surgery entails for those of you who have never seen it. Uh, what potential complication one is looking at for post-operative assessment, uh, which quite a lot of you do for us, and what local policies and procedures are at ESHT. So let's start off with the human lens. So you can see that there are essentially three layers to the lens. You've got the nucleus in the center, which is surrounded by the cortex and then that's surrounded by the capsule and there's an anterior capsule and a posterior capsule. Uh, so the epithelial cells um, ju just um, on the capsule at the equator um, proliferate and as they elongate they lose the nucleus um, and they become lens fibers and these lens fibers have proteins called crystallines and these crystallines are um, like the, in a way, the, the way collagen is laid in the cornea, are laid in a particular uh, configuration such that they are clear and transparent. And that's why, um, you know, when um, the lens is um, at a very uh, young age, it's transparent. And as it gets older, it becomes opaque. And we'll go into that a little bit in more detail. Uh, but the, nerve, the, the actual nucleus itself doesn't have any innovation and it doesn't have a blood supply. And here is just a little bit about um, how big things are. So the characteristics of the lens. Most, uh, you know, if you know the eye is something around 22 and a half to 25 millimeters from cornea to retina. Um, the corneal thickness is something around 550 microns. Anterior chamber depth is something between two and a half to three millimeters. So actually, when we're doing cataract surgery, you're working in very tight spaces and you use a viscoelastic to expand the anterior chamber in order to have a bit more depth. The um, lens anterior posterior width is around five to six millimeters and the equator diameter is around nine to 10 millimeters. So that kind of gives you some sort of idea about the dimensions, but, but mainly really um, the fact that the chamber of the eye is only two to three millimeters and the actual length the width of the lens 
is around five to six millimeters. So it's all kind of very tiny stuff. Um, moving on to classification, there are different ways of classifying cataracts, and I've divided this into categories. Um, and you've kind of used this in the language that you use when you're trying to describe cataracts. So you can talk about cataracts with respect to etiology, so how, how, you know what has caused the cataract, maturity, uh, morphology, um, age, and whether it's congenital or acquired. So if we start with etiology, which is kind of um, reasons behind cataracts, so cataracts could be congenital, and we know this uh, from uh, familial or genetic um, li linkage studies where cataracts can run in, in families. Um, intrauterine infections such as rubella, toxoplasmosis, herpetic infections can all present with cataracts and um, certain medication used during pregnancy. So that's why it's one of the tests that the pediatric uh, team do before they discharge new babies is to check the red reflex and make sure that there's no cataract. And there's an example of a congenital cataract for you here. The most commonest cause of cataract is age, so advancing age. Um, then we've got the metabolic causes such as diabetes is probably the commonest one. Um, I've mentioned a couple of other rarer conditions for you there, reduced calcium and Wilson's disease. Um, medication is another big one. So especially patients who've been on steroids, often steroids tend to give you a posterior subcapsular opacity. Um, it could be that they were on steroids many, many years ago and the cataract just comes on now. So there's no clear line with respect to how much steroids you take or how long you've been on it with respect to the cataract formation. But mitotics are like pilocarpin um, can, can do that and still use uh, in some patients with glaucoma, although really as tertiary or quad, you know, or uh, fourth line of drugs. And amiodrone, which is something that's used for the cardiovascular system. Trauma, um, so that's another, another big one. Trauma tends to be unilateral, again, uh, it can it come on very acutely or it can take years. I've seen patients where uh, they're presented with sudden onset of um, cataract, but the trauma was 20 years ago and it's unilateral. So it can be like that, but it does give you some sort of clue on what to expect. Inflammation, so anterior posterior uveitis, another example. So you've got congenital age, metabolic medication, trauma, inflammation. And you've got disease related. So patients with Down syndrome will develop cataracts or those with atopic dermatitis that's associated with cataracts. Things that we do to patients such as retro detachment surgery um, or every patient within 12 to 18 months following retro detachment surgery will develop some sort of cataract. And we often see them being referred back to us uh, from our tertiary center to manage and deal with the cataract. And then there are the environmental factors such as UV rays, poor nutrition and uh, smoking. So that was kind of describing the cataract with etiology. Um, you might want to do that when you're seeing a patient in clinic, they've got a cataract. You say this patient has an age-related cataract or this patient, uh, it's probably a steroid-induced cataract or this patient with diabetes has diabetic-related cataract. And that can be kind of a nice way of describing the cataract. Uh, but another way of defining the cataract would be morphological. So based on anatomical position. And if you can see, uh, the picture of the lens here. So you've got um, essentially a nuclear cataract, which involves the nucleus. So if you remember, the lens has three structures, the nucleus, the cortex, and the capsule. And then you've got the cortical cataract, which is between the cortex and capsule. And then you've got these polar cataracts, which can occur kind of right on the capsule. And they are actually quite a big risk. So, um, I'll get into that in a minute, but you can, you know, with the sub, subcapsular cataracts, mostly posterior subcapsular cataracts associated with steroids, as I mentioned, I haven't seen much in the way of anterior subcapsular cataract. Nuclear cataracts, again, you know, you can have yellow, brunescent to white. Um, cortical cataracts can appear as spikes in the cortex and then the polar. Now, polar cataracts in particular have got a very high risk of a complication because the cataract involves the capsule itself. So when it comes to um, trying to take the nucleus away from the capsule, sometimes that can make the capsule burst and the lens can drop to the vitreous, which would be disastrous. So this would be another way. And, and I think a lot of you are used to actually describing the cataracts as patient with nuclear cataract or posterior subcapsular cataract when you're referring patients on. 
Now, the third way is to talk about the maturity of the cataract. And, you know, a lot of patients that we see would come with what we call soft cataract. So that's what we call an immature cataract. When a cataract is mature, uh, it's, uh, the, it's completely opaque. So you can't really see through the lens. Um, and that's kind of more traditional white cataracts. Now, uh, back 11 years ago, when I started at ESH, I might have seen a white cataract really once or twice a month. Now I would say probably once, or tw once a week, there would be a white cataract. And whether that's the COVID effect, I, I don't mean COVID causing it. I mean, the patient's waiting and there's been such delay in patients coming on. But we certainly see a lot more mature cataracts coming through, which of course would uh, push up the risk of a complication. Hypermature cataracts are mature cataracts, i.e. opaque, you can't see through, but the, the capsule is shrunken and there is leakage of lens material into the anterior chamber. And that can cause inflammation and can cause really high pressure, something which we call phacolytic glaucoma. And that's um, a, 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 is a medical emergency. We really need to remove the cataract before the eye gets uh, irreversibly damaged from um, high pressure. I've actually never seen a Morgagnian cataract, uh, but um, in a Morgagnian cataract, you have a very high mature cataract, and then there's inferior sinking of the nucleus with calcium deposits on the lens capsule. So here is a very uh, good example of a Morgagnian cataract where you can see that there's the sinking of this very brunescent cataract underneath um, uh, from it within the capsule. So that's another way of describing your cataracts, whether they're um, immature, mature, hypermature, or more gagnon. I would say uh, majority of the patients are immature with some mature, and it's quite unusual to see in this country anyway, hypermature and more gagnon cataracts. We mentioned age as a classification, uh, and age-related change is a nice um, kind of very simple um, study that shows that uh, cataracts increase in incidence with age, and when you're in your 70s, you've got 90% chance of having a cataract, and over 80, almost everybody has a cataract. Now, that doesn't mean everybody over 80 needs cataract surgery, and we'll, we'll get to indications on when you might want to offer somebody cataract surgery, but it does tell you that with age, lens changes, like everything else in your body. Now, personal physiology of cataract formation would be a, a lecture on its own. It's not very well understood. There are lots of different pathways and uh, uh, processes that have been described. But in essence, um, there is opaqueness of the lens and lens is made of water and protein fibers and puts it very simply, when the protein fibers clump together, they become opaque because they lose that 3D structure um, the way they are kind of placed in a very regular fashion um, in, in the actual lens. And as the degeneration and opaqueness of the uh, lens fibers grow, you get these aberrant fibers and deposition of other materials in the face. And um, you, within, within your lens fibers, you've got these kind of membrane proteins and they are responsible for uh, movement of ions and water through um, um, kind of lens fibers. And of course, when those get affected, then there is imbalance of water and metabolic uh, electrolytes that are moving between the, the uh, lens fibers and that will uh, make the cataract harder and thicker. Now, th this is a very, very basic way of just describing how it happens in steroid-induced cataracts, diabetic cataracts, you know, various pathways. There are um, other processes that can happen that cause it. But in an age-related uh, process, it's essentially the proteins that, the crystallines that come together and um, the usual function of the lens fibers are uh, not restored with age, Therefore, you start getting a, a, a clear lens starts getting opaque. Now, symptoms, you're all pretty much familiar with this. You would have many patients who would come to you and, uh, you know, they would present with um, various symptoms. Most patients that I see tend to have blurred vision and most of the time it's gradual. Uh, we have, I have seen sudden uh, loss of vision with cataract. And often that's as a result of something like trauma, obviously, or if there isn't trauma or there's nothing like that, you know, um, a patient may have just closed one eye accidentally and then realize that they can't see out of the other and they present as if it's sudden. But in fact, you know that they've probably had it for a very long time. So blurring of vision is kind of the most common symptom. And then with posterior capsular opacities, uh, patients would often complain of 
problems with vision in bright light because the pupil constricts, light goes through the central P, uh, posterior capsular opacity and it splits and that can cause problems. Um, glare and monocular diplopia um, can occur with cortical cataracts or again with posterior subcapsular uh, cataracts and that's due to splitting of the light. Um, we've all seen patients, well you've all seen patients with myopic shift where um, you almost kind of give it a second sight where patients become myopic, they'll come to you and say it's great I can actually read now, I didn't use it before but far is difficult uh, but that's short-lived because the myopia will go higher and higher so it become less useful um, and the lens becomes more and more opaque so actually what they can read will become more difficult to see as well. Loss of red reflex, so I should say red reflex not white reflex, so loss of red reflex you see uh, again in pediatric uh, patients or in mature or hypermature cataracts. Um, reduced color vision um, is another symptom and cortical cataracts can also cause these colored halos around lights. So those are kind of the typical symptoms that a cataract patient uh, might come to you. And within, within the history, um, we often divide history into presently complaint, uh, past medical history, drug history, past ocular history. So within each, I've kind of tried to highlight what's really important. And within the presenting history, you want to just see, was it a gradual thing? Uh, and really, how is it affecting the patient? Because, you know, I've had patients who have had 6'6 six, six vision, six, six vision uh, but the other eye is 6'4", and even that um, kind of slight decline in vision for them is a lot. Um, they are, whether it's affecting the painting or whether they are kind of driving and it's bothering them, that's important for them. And I've got patients where vision is 6'24", but actually they're still managing to read and they're not that fast. So really you want to see how your patient's affected by it. Um, it's very important to ask them about their activities, their hobbies, why do they want surgery and what their expectation is, just to get a feel of what they want from the consultation. And you guys are very good actually. So most patients that come to clinic end up being converted to have cataracts, uh, cataracts done. It's rare to see patients where, you know, patient comes in, they have cataracts and actually they don't want surgery. So I think we've got that process quite nicely sorted. Um, previous medical history will help you towards the etiology. So as I mentioned to you, you know, is there a systemic condition? Um, is there a, a kind of is some sort of family history? What medication they've been on? You know, is there anything you can understand from the medical history in the past that could have contributed to the uh, cataract? In particular, you want to ask about trauma because actually trauma can significantly reduce, uh, increase the risk of a complication. I had a lady who came to me with a unilateral cataract and she had a trauma from a, a bungee jump cord hitting her eye. And actually that cataract is very high risk. So it's very important to explain to her the, the risk of that kind of surgery because they, they end up talking to lots of patients who will say to them, oh yeah, yeah, I had my cataract done, was done in about 10 minutes and the next day I could see everything. And that's what gets into their head. And then they all think that they should expect the same thing. So it's important to just understand the etiology of the cataract so you can risk stratify them accordingly. Medication is not just important uh, to get why the cataract is there, but also how difficult the cataract might become. So we've known now since uh, early 2000 that alpha blockers and um, drugs like tamsulosin can cause havoc when it comes to cataract surgery because they affect the iris, something called intraoperative VLP iris syndrome. And um, actually, there's no point in stopping the drug because it's an idiosyncratic reaction. And once the iris has been exposed to even very small doses of these drugs, stopping it won't make a difference. So that, again, that's another thing that we, we would be interested in knowing whether they take that or not. Um, I'd say the most important thing <clears throat> with ophthalmic history is previous refractive surgery, uh, you know, LASIK, LASIK, PRK, all these things where starting to hit 1980s and now you're starting to see that generation developing cataracts. Um, I would have said that the earlier formulas um, were very heavily dependent on exactly what was done, how much was taken, you know, K readings before and after, but actually now we have very good formulas um, that can guesstimate what kind of lens um, you need to put in to get to achieve a certain thing. And, and they're, very, they're very good now with, that, with regards to that. Um, contact lens wear is important because if you've been wearing contact lenses 
uh, then that will affect the biometry. You'll have to wait for two weeks or pen your Pentacam scans. And of course, one thing we always look for is current refraction. Now, <clears throat> when they come through you, they'll always have the refraction. Occasionally, when we get the GP letter without the company often letter, there's no refraction. And that can be quite difficult because uh, they don't always have their glasses and you have to have for symmetry and, you know, we'd prefer to have the refraction there. So that's very important for us to try and see what the target refraction should be. Um, now, family history. <clears throat> Sorry, I, when I, I, a family issue, again, would point to a genetic cause, especially if the patients are presenting at an early age. <clears throat> so we discuss target refraction, and most patients go for emetropia. So this is uh, such that they can see distant. Um, and at that point, we obviously look at um, your refraction and see if there's any significant stigmatism for them to... Um, expect um, what they should wear afterwards. And that's actually quite important, again, because they talk to their friends and they'll come to you and say, oh, hold on, my friend could see far without glasses and now I, I need glasses for distance and this. So, so it is important to know uh, what things are. And sometimes when we get caught is that we have the refraction, but we don't have the biometry. And if the refraction says that there is no stigmatism, but in fact, the lens is neutralizing the corneal stigmatism, um, sometimes it's on the day of the surgery that you say, well, actually, look, you've got two diopters of stigmatism, you need glasses for this and some here. But it's still important to have that. And in an ideal setting, you would want to have the, all, the, you know, all the patients done in one stop where they come and see you, they have the biometry, and you tell you know, whoever who's in the biometry that if the stigmatism is more than one or one and a half, let me know so the patient is aware that that's what they're going to have. COVID's affected that a bit, but certainly that's what we would want to be doing when things are up and running. So anyway, emetropia is what most patients want. They want to be able to drive. Uh, occasionally, and those who are historically myopic, they want to be left around minus two. Bookworms, they want to read, um, especially if they're not yet really um, drivers or they don't go out that often or do distant related tasks, they want to be left minus two. But I'd say majority of my patients are emetropic. Um, in patients with unilateral cataract, things get a little bit difficult because if the other eye is, you know, 6'6", six, six, um, and there isn't a cataract there and they have no symptoms uh, with that, but the other eye has changed, then you have to match the eyes together in order to avoid anosometropia. And um, if there is a cataract there, of course, you can aim for metropia and do the other eye. But if there are not they don't have any symptoms and you're doing the other cataract purely to match the eyes up to avoid anisometropia, um, the commissioners can give us a hard time about that because that's not an indication for cataract surgery. But obviously in an ideal world, you'd want to do that. So I'd like to see something in the other eye, either symptoms or some sort of lens change or something in order to do it. Um, I've mentioned corrective of stigmatism. Uh, so we have toric lenses and that uh, a monofocal toric lens can give you um, or can reduce your spectacle dependence. I, I like using the term reduce spectacle dependence rather than telling patient you will be completely spectacle independent because if the eye heals in a, in a different way or you know if the biometry isn't bang on and they might just need a bit of correction, they'll come back here and say, oh, okay, you, you, you said I will never ever have to wear uh, glasses. So you have to just be careful with what you say. So, it, but toric lenses are very good and in fact, uh, much better than having laser eye surgery to correct stigmatism. So if they've got a, if they've got um, a cataract and they've also got corneal stigmatism, you can correct that with a toric lens. And I would normally want to see one and a half diopters of stig corneal stigmatism or more before I offer them a toric lens. But don't forget, that will get them either for distance or near. Um, and then, of course, there's the presbiopic correcting IOLs, and we'll talk about that in a second. So that's more for kind of distant, intermediate, and near vision um, all together. Um, and, um, you know, it's important to have that discussion, especially if your patient is very keen to reduce the dependence on spectacles. So um, what we always say to our trainees or people who do the cataract clinics is, please, please, please discuss these target refractions with the patient. When you're, seeing the pay, when you're seeing them in clinic, because it's a very difficult discussion to have when in fact they turn up for cataract surgery and they have no idea what uh, uh, the, the, the situation is. So this should really be discussed before that. Um, 
with respect to examination, so we've kind of discussed uh, the issues around the history. So you start off with the vision, obviously, you hopefully want to see uh, reduction in vision, um, as one would expect with, uh, with a cataract. Um, pupil check is very important. So cataract should never cause a relative apparent pupillary defect. Um, An RAPD would indicate optic nerve disease or significant retinal disease. So, um, uh, and, uh, you know, you shouldn't see an RAPD with cataract. Um, look at the eyelids. So start off front, going to the back. Is there any blepharitis? Again, that needs treatment before cataract surgery. So patient comes in with blepharitis, they turn off on the nerve cataract, there's significant blepharitis. That is a cause, commonest cause of endophthalmitis, something none of us want to see. So that needs to be treated. Um, is a, you know, entropion, ectropion, ptosis, anything like that, anything that needs treatment before we do the cataracts. Um, with respect to the cornea, again, you know, just basic stuff. Look at the cornea. Is there any scarring that could uh, cause a problem with the view? Any scarring that could alter the biometry? Um, is the eye dry? Because that can affect the biometry, um, and significantly so. And any evidence of endothelial dystrophy? which might be important prognostically. Uh, iris, you know, translimination might indicate something else is going on, like secondary glaucoma, previous herpetic infection or trauma, which the patient might be unaware of. Um, heterochromia would indicate Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis. Patients like that will develop cataract. Actually, it's one of the things that happens with Fuchs uh, um, heterochromic iridocyclitis. And uh, you want to start them on steroid drops before cataract surgery um, uh, in order to avoid uh, really bad inflammation in those eyes. Um, and then you look at the eye, you know, the iris, is it poor dilation uh, because they're diabetic or they're on tamsulosin or something like that? And that's important to mention uh, surgically. Um, I mentioned to you that the anterior chamber is about two and a half millimeters. If the anterior chamber is very shallow, then that could add on to the risk. And you know, we all talk about prophylactic peripheral iridectomies and with new evidence showing that, you know, um, perhaps we are doing the PIs a bit more than we should. Certainly, if there's a shallow anterior chamber and you feel that there should be, you, you might want to do a PI and there's a significant cataract, then, the, then removing the lens would actually cure that problem. So you can kill two birds with the same stone. Um, and actually, that's the kind of patients that you want to do sooner than later, because as the cataract grows, then the anterior chamber becomes more and more shallow and then it becomes quite difficult surgically. Look at the cataract itself. You can grade the cataract, uh, look to see if it's unstable, i.e. when the patient moves their eye, does the cataract, does the lens move? Is there any pseudo exfoliation? I'll show you pictures of this in a minute. And that can all again affect the um, uh, complexity of the surgery itself, in particular uh, polar cataracts that I mentioned to you before. Patients with macular degeneration, could it be traumatic from um, an injection? And you could see tracks of needle going in. Again, all very rare stuff, but important to see. This is the LOX3 uh, lens opacification system. Um, you know, it's kind of probably used more in research. Um, I've never had a referral with anyone saying to me, this patient has an NC4, C4, P4 cataract. You know, you just wouldn't do that. But it, it's just a way, nice way of grading the cataract. And uh, it's been around since 1993. <clears throat> and you have this in front of you, especially when you're doing research. I remember I was doing a, a research on a drug for Alzheimer's disease, and they wanted to see if it caused cataract. And I had one of these in front of me. So I had to follow patients up for about a year and see how they changed and how to grade them accordingly. But it just goes on about, uh, you know, the nuclear bit is kind of, the, the, the color change um, and with the cortical bit, how much of the, you do a retro translimination and see how much of the cortical cataract is invading your view and same with the posterior subcapsular opacity. But it's a, it's a nice way of kind of grading the cataract in those kind of scenarios. But of course we wouldn't expect that from your referrals, but it's just nice to know that that's there if you wanted to have a look at it. Um, and then vitreous, you look at, has there been a vitreous attachment floaters? Interestingly, patients notice floaters more after cataract surgery. So that's because you're removing something that's impeding light and the shadow of the floater will kind of bang, go on the retina and patients can see the floaters more, but the brain will get used to that and will get rid of it. Now that's very different to an acute floater after cataract surgery because that will need looking at. But if somebody says, oh, I've had floaters all the time, I just notice them a bit more. 
then that probably explains it. But if you have an acute floater following cataract surgery because of the fact that the capsule is going up and down during surgery and there might have been a PVD, we need to, we need to see them or you need to see them to make sure that there's no tears in the retina. Um, and when you're looking at the back of the eye, you know, are you, you know, is the retina healthy? I always do an OCT, always do an OCT in my patients uh, if they're having cataract surgery. You, your, he, the human eye is 20 times less able, 20 to 30 times less able than an OCT to pick up anything in the back of the eye. So there's just no excuse not to, not to do it. And, and the problem is that the patient comes with macular edema afterwards and you're often asked, well, what do we do? And my first question is, well, what was the scan before? If they haven't had that done, it's very difficult to then kind of try and see what might have happened. So um, I might be overzealous as a as, as a retina man, but but it's I have picked up patients with intraretinal fluid, even wet AMD, and you do a cataract surgery when the macula is not controlled, and you they won't be happy bunnies. So you just want to be be careful on that. And then of course look at the optic nerve. Does the nerve look okay? Um, you know, is there any visual field defects? And, you know, this is particularly important, obviously, in glaucoma patients, because all the time with patients have comorbidities like macular degeneration, glaucoma, other issues, you're trying to guess how much is each contributing. And that's not always easy to say, but that's important to warn your patients because you remove the cataract and, you know, they've got bad glaucoma and the vision doesn't improve. They'll, they'll want to know why that is. You need to make sure they understand that. Um, with visual fields in particular, you know, stroke patients, and if they've got very dense hemianopic defects, um, then, you know, cataract, and they've got a cataract, and they think they've got the defect because of the cataract, that won't change once that's removed. So why would I offer someone surgery? Well, because you want to improve the vision. Uh, so um, that's in most cases. Um, sometimes the patient is not particularly aware but they come to you and say, well, actually you can't drive anymore. You know, you need to, you need to have these done. So that'd be another reason because they want to keep the independence and carry on driving. Um, glare or diplopia can be quite troublesome, especially in bright lights with certain conditions like cortical cataracts and posterior capsular opacity cataracts. Um, sometimes because you want to see the back of the eye. So you know actually that the cataract is unlikely to make a massive change, but you can't see the scans to treat the AMD. You can't you can't do a proper visual field test, so you can't assess the glaucoma. And then you might actually offer cataract surgery to the patient at that point. Um, and with respect to something simple like AMD, you want that to be stable, glaucoma, you want all these other conditions to be as stable as possible before you offer them surgery. Um, correcting anisometropia. So, you know, if one eye is shifting, um, you know, minus two, minus three, three four diopters of difference and glasses are becoming difficult, you might want to offer them. And then medical reasons. So um, <clears throat> I mentioned to you very shallow anterior chambers. If there is a bit of a cataract there, uh, then you might want to do that rather than doing a PI. Or patients with um, hypermature cataracts where the lens material is leaking into the AC causing phacolytic glaucoma. Um, and then when I see a patient, I'm often looking to see, okay, what else is going on? So uh, within the eye, is there, have they got a small eye? Is there any, everything we've been through really, corneal scarring, shallow anterior chamber, is there any pseudo exfoliation? Uh, is there posterior synechiae? Could they have IFIS? Um, is the lens very soft or very dense? Um, and those are kind of what I call ocular uh, problems and then patient related problems. So the positioning, uh, I'm kind of thinking, how are they going to be on the bed? Is there a bit of head tremor? Are there, is there any breathing difficulties? Um, <clears throat> again, very young or very old, uh, patients who are very anxious, patients with dementia. I mean, most of the time, actually, a lot of our uh, patients who have got dementia and you need special consent form are actually completely fine. Um, and they, they are very good and they follow instructions and, 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 and that's not an issue. Uh, but in some cases, you have to think uh, whether they've managed it and uh, what medication they're on, etc. So at all times, when you're seeing the patient, you're thinking about all these things or what could potentially increase the risk, make your life difficult. Because when you're consenting them, you need to mention that to them. Don't forget, you know, 98% of patients, surgery goes completely fine. But it's the 2% that you need to make sure you had kind of adequately consented that really matters because those are the two, that's the group that's going to complain. So I've just got some basic pictures here. You've got pseudo exfoliation here. You can hopefully see my arrow uh, to the left of your screen. 
um, and you've got here an eye, the pupil that doesn't dilate. So this is going to need a malugan ring in order to um, uh, expand the pupil, otherwise, or iris hooks, otherwise you're not gonna get to that lens. This is a patient with really bad iritis and posterior synechi. So you need to go in, release all that synechi, then put a ri uh, ring or hooks in in order to access the lens. This is, um, you can see kind of prolapse, these are not my, my cases, by the way, they're completely lifted from internet, but anyway, prolapse iris uh, at the wound, um, and that happens in patients with floppy iris syndrome. So even if, even if you might have a good section, you know, the iris can prolapse and it can make surgery an absolute nightmare. Here you can see hooks in action, so you have to kind of get the iris out, and that's why sometimes patients with malugan ring or hooks, when they come for post-op assessment, the pupil is not round because you have to manipulate it in order to get to the lens. That's very important. You can see the uh, pupil there, and there's a downward movement of the lens, and that will need a tertiary center referral to deal with that cataract because this is a sublux lens. This picture is meant to show uh, corneal thickening and Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, important when it comes to removing the cataract. And afterwards, they'll have macular, you know, uh, corneal edema. So again, uh, important to do that. Here, bottom of the picture, very shallow anterior chamber, and they can be a real nightmare. So you have to think, should I give them a bit of oral diamox to try and dehydrate the vitreous? Think about the subtenons not really packing that orbit full of lignocaine and making life a bit more difficult for yourself. So these are all kind of situations that you are faced with as a consultant um, and, you know, uh, difficult patients that are coming through. Corneal scarring can obstruct the view, so you might need vision blue in order to get that, and of course you definitely need vision blue here because you've got a hypermature cataract. And those are kind of eye-related stuff, and with patients, I've got an anxious person there, or a really young or a really old person, really young patients are also a nightmare because they, they, they can't tolerate topical anesthetic, so often you have to give them soft or, or actually oral sedation. Um, since COVID, we've moved pretty much, well, we've moved all our operations to Bexhill. We can't IV sedate them, but actually it's amazing how much you can get away with oral sedation. So I've definitely changed my practice um, and, and that's something new I've learned. But your, your super anxious patient, I would say actually, you know, if they're able to tolerate a subtenons injection, then the surgery would be fine. Um, even if you have a, to abandon at that point, once you've done the local anesthetic, as long as you haven't opened the eye, uh, the eye will heal and there's no problem. Positioning is always important. So we always ask patients whether they can lie flat. They don't have to lie flat, but you know, if they can't lie flat, you need to kind of position them such that you can at least have them fairly straight so you can do the surgery. And patients with breathing difficulties, often they need to be uh, kind of sat up if, uh, um, at 45 degrees and we've got really nice tables that can manage, uh, manage accordingly. And of course, those with dementia. Um, so, when I see a patient with cataracts um, and I'm trying to warn them about uh, complications, the first foremost is infection. One in a thousand can have endophthalmitis and that's complete blindness when you've got a good going endophthalmitis. So they need to understand that. Um, then you've got the top TAS, which is the toxic anterior shock syndrome. Looks like endophthalmitis, but in fact comes on fairly quickly within the first day. Endophthalmitis tends to be day two, day three task tends to be fairly straight away um, and it goes away with just steroids, whereas in the and, and they've got quite good vision recovery. So task happens because the eye is severely allergic to something, the, something in the viscoelastic um, or something within the uh, instruments that you use as you're doing cataract surgery. Um, but, you know, our fear is in the thankfully very rare, probably one in three or 4,000 realistically with current antibiotics uh, that we use, but one to the thousand is what you tell the patients. Drop nucleus is every surgeon's nightmare. So you're doing your cataract surgery and if the posterior capsule is breached and the lens goes south, the only way to, do, will, to deal with that would be to send it to a VR surgeon. Um, posterior capsule rupture we mentioned um, and we all benchmarked against all this, by the way. So, so your PCR rate needs to be less than, less than two. Um, and uh, you kind of, uh, you need to remember to make sure you write all the comorbidities to make sure that patients are uh, adequately risk stratified. Dialysis is when you lose zonules and you know, you've got movement of the uh, ca a capsule complex and you might not be able to put a lens in. Supracroidal hemorrhage, 
can happen when the eye goes rock hard suddenly during surgery. Thank God I've never had one, but it, it is a nightmare because um, you literally, everything starts to come out of the wound. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's horrific. I feel sorry for anyone who's had it, but it can just happen. You can just get a massive portal hemorrhage, pressure shoots up, and all you can do is just close up. There's, not, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, iris prolapse and trauma, um, you could do by putting the iris back, stitching that section if the iris keeps coming out and going from somewhere else. Leaking wound tend to happen um, if you've got a very dense cataract where your wound is tight and it's, you know, it heats up and it just won't close again, needs um, a stitch. Um, you've got other things like aqueous misdirection or, hemor or hemorrhage in the arterial chamber. Thankfully rare. So here's just some pictures for you. That's endophthalmitis there. So hypopion, very sick looking eye. Um, you've got that big yellow thing in the back of the eye, beautiful picture of a drop nucleus. Uh, which, as I mentioned, is, is, is a nightmare for everyone. This is kind of toxic anterior shock syndrome. You know, they come in the next day with this and it goes away completely with just use of topical steroids. Um, this patient has loads of endothelial pigment changes. That's chronic endophthalmitis over there. Um, here you can see the kind of capsule being ruptured at the back, vitreous coming through. So you need to do a vitrectomy, but even patients with posterior capsule rupture actually end up having quite good results. Uh, as long as you do a good vitrectomy and then you put a lens in, most of the time you can put the lens, if you've got a good anterior capsule in the sulcus, uh, then actually the eventual vision is quite good. Um, here you can see a capsule tension ring being put out because there is dialysis. So you need to get the capsule back to its position that it was. And then kind of other complications that are not so serious, so refractive surprise, uh, macular, um, uh, well, sorry, I mean, they are serious, but not like as acute as what we discussed. So refractive surprise, macular edema happens four to six weeks. Eyes can often be dry because of the use of iodine. Allergy, especially to maxitrol, neumycin. Posterior capsular opacity tends to happen a few weeks to months. Intraocular lens opacity, is a known phenomenon and it can happen with certain models. Some of the Zeiss models had this problem and you need to change the lens because the, the lens itself has become opacified, but thankfully again, very rare. And as I mentioned to you, vitreous attachment, which can actually cause a retinal tear or retinal attachment. So these are kind of some of the other things. So, so um, I, my practice again, is if I've got a patient who's got if I can't get the vision better than 612 unaided or with pinhole, I'll always scan the back of the eye because they can get macular edema post-op. And that can happen in up to 2% of patients. So it's quite important to realize that. And then you've got just, as I mentioned, your dry eye from iodine and retinal detachment, all kind of quite rare and unusual, your posterior capsular opacity there. And this is an example of a lens that has opacified. And the only thing you can do with that is to take the lens out, which is a massive surgical risk. Biometry is very important. So it's important to understand when you've got a good test and a bad test. And that's important when it comes to uh, counseling your patients with your target refraction and refractive surprise. If I'm worried in any way by the shape of the cornea or if, the, or if I've got very high seal on the um, uh, refraction or on the K readings from the biometry, I will order a pentacam to make sure I'm not dealing with irregular stigmatism or a keratoconus patient because, uh, you know, again, that's important to understand what, it doesn't mean you can't do the cataract, but the patient just needs to understand what to expect afterwards. In particular, the need for glasses for distance near and middle. Um, so just going to talk the next part of the lecture um, in the next 10 minutes about intraocular lenses. And um, after that, we can do some questions. So how Ridley, that's the chap over here back in, 40s um, found, found out that actually the uh, pilots who were in World War II, if they ever lived through a crash, um, the kind of um, the window bit, the perspex that went inside the eye, the eye wouldn't reject it. So he had this idea that actually, why, why don't we try and put a lens inside the eye? And before then, of course, patients were being left aphakic. So he created the first biconvex perspex which is about 138 milligrams and patients were often myopic to the tune of minus 24 and six diopters of sill. 
not great. But then you saw, saw six generations of lenses with essentially anterior chamber lenses, iris supported changes, then more anterior chamber lenses than two, what we now have posterior uh, chamber lenses that we use. And these are some examples of anterior chamber lenses, um, you know, where you clip them to the iris or they sat in the anterior chamber over here um, and now superseded with what most of us now use, flexible intraocular lenses, which tend to be the hydrophobic acrylic. Uh, and there's kind of different examples here, but you can roughly see that your typical intraocular lens has uh, an optic of six millimeters with um, the whole length being about 13 millimeters across. Um, and there's this new concept of a spheric IOLs. So um, sp spheric, spheric collaboration is when light is bent, when it hits the peripheral part of a lens, is bent too much. So you can see in the in the picture here where you've got spherical aberration and you've got uh, quite you haven't got a single um, kind of focal point. Whereas if you had an aspheric, uh, um, you know, eye or, or the spherical aberration was eliminated, you can get a very clear focal point. And that's important because your cornea has a positive spherical aberration, whereas uh, the human lens has a negative spherical aberration. So they kind of balance each other out. So when you remove a lens you then have too much positive spherical aberration. And that's why um, IOLs now, the modern generation IOLs are aspheric to counterbalance that. So you get better contrast sensitivity, better vision, better mesopic vision, better nighttime driving, but of course they're um, expensive and um, they can cause some problems with depth of perception. Um, and I kind of mentioned to you that when you say a patient, it's quite important to talk about target refraction. So do they want, are you, are you going to choose a monofocal IOL, monofocal toric to manage the stigmatism? Are they going to be um, wanting to be independent of glasses for everything? In which case, you're thinking of monovision or multifocal lenses. Multifocal lens is no good if they've got significant stigmatism. So you then think about a multifocal toric. Then you've got the newer extended depth EDOF lenses, except extended depth of range or depth of focus lenses. And I'll come to that in a second. Accommodative IOLs, or you can mix and match different types. So lots and lots of different things to think about with the patient sitting in front of you. Um, but one thing, and I've put this on in red, only because I want to wake up those who are asleep. Um, it's very, very important because once that lens goes in, it's very difficult to come out. So you must establish very clearly from the patient what is their hobbies, what do they, what is their attitude towards wearing glasses, what kind of personality uh, they have, what kind of activities do they do, how much of the activity is carried out in low lit conditions. What is the knowledge of premium lenses? Is it something you're telling them or do they come to you saying, oh, I've read this or my friend has had this. And this is all very important to establish before you start thinking about target refraction and how you're going to manage them. So presbyopic IO correcting IOLs have been around for some time. Um, accommodative IOLs are rarely used, I would say maybe four or 5% of surgeons actually use them. Uh, and um, I'll come to how that works in a minute. Most of us uh, would use trifocal or EGOF lenses in order to achieve or reduce uh, spectacle independence. Monovision is a great way of doing it as well, but for the right group of patients. So if they've always had monovision, so one far, one near, and you're kind of gonna leave them like that, that's fine. Um, you, or you could give them a contact lens trial to make sure that they can manage monovision because they lose that depth of perception. Uh, but it's not great if they've got significant cataracts. That makes the contact lens trial quite difficult. So how do we choose between the two? Well, a more, a, 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 an accommodative IL, and so I don't really use this that much, essentially uses the ability of the ciliary muscle uh, within the eye to achieve accommodation. And for every one millimeter anterior movement of the lens, you get nearly two diopters of accommodation. Um, but there are not many, so you've got the crystal lens, there are not many prototypes that are around. And you know the fact that not many people are using them makes me think that perhaps it's not uh, kind of that popular. Um, so I use multifocal intraocular lenses in the right group of patients, and I'll come to that in a second. And the essentially different types. We've got the refractive multifocal IOLs. And these are kind of uh, concentric rings where you've got essentially the central part, which is good for distance, followed by uh, uh, the next bit, which is for near vision. And then the, the third concentric ring for distance. And then the fourth for, for near. And this is kind of 
trying to simulate different things in light and dark conditions. So in light conditions, when the pupil is constricted, you're really going to be using your eyes for distance. And as you're reading, um, perhaps in not super bright lights and the pupil dilates a little bit, you can use the second ring to help you read a bit uh, with that. And then, you know, driving at night, the third ring comes into play for distance and, you know, reading with in low illumination, the fourth ring for, for um, near again. So these multifocal IOs, refractive IOs are very much pupil dependent. And then the other type of multifocal IOs are diffractive multifocal IOs, which have a, a spheric front. Oh, sorry. And that's to, uh, to manage the kind of spheric vibration as I, as I mentioned to you. But at the back, they've got these diffractive rings, which are presented as steps. And with each step, um, you focus the light on near or far. So you can see in the picture here, you've got, as the light's kind of coming through you, it gives the patient a near focus and a fo far focus. And really with these multifocal lenses, you know, there's this three month period of neuroadaptation where the eyes have to learn to use these lenses. You know, our eyes are not, you know, when we are young, we can accommodate and manage to achieve all this. But when you're trying to learn almost to see through these new lenses, it can take some time. And I must say, it is not, it is not for everybody. So one of the problems that we used to have with diffractive multifocal IOLs, uh, as with other types of um, like refractive multifocal IOLs, is reduce contrast sensitivity, glares, halos, etc. as the light is going through these uh, rings and steps. And apodization is a way of dealing with that by trying to make the steps a bit lighter. So, you, so with the kind of more newer generation of multifocal IOLs, which have apodized diffractive optics, they tend to be less of a problem, but they're still there. And it's important to the other patient. And that's why um, it becomes very important to understand how much do they want to be spectacle independent and, and what's their tolerances to things. So just a very quick overview of refractive versus diffractive multifocal IOLs. I kind of always say that diffractive multifocal IOLs are good for patients who want to have really good distant vision and quite good near vision, but the intermediate vision isn't brilliant. And the refractive ones are good for intermediate and distance, but not great for near. Um, but we've now got these trifocal lenses, which can give you actually distance, intermediate and near, such as the panoptics lens um, uh, and uh, physio um, lenses as well. So, so they, they have moved on and they there are other uh, lens as well, and that would be a whole kind of talk on its own, but just skimming through the general principles here. So with respect to selection, um, you know, I often show them a picture if they're very keen to have a multifocal lens, say, look, this is the kind of glare that you would expect if you were driving at night and make them see what they might be, uh, they might be getting themselves into because uh, halos and glare reduce contrast sensitivity. All these things that are the three big things with multifocal IOs reduce with time, significantly so over three months. But in five to 10% of patients, they can persist. And 5% of patients actually stop driving as a result of that. So you need to make sure that the person who's going for the multifocal lens is very, very aware of, um, of what they're about to get themselves into. And I'll, and I'll kind of tell you what kind of process I go through in order to make sure that they've understood that. So determine patients' visual needs and wishes, so pros and cons of multifocal IOLs, uh, make them understand that they're never completely free of glasses forever and ever. Uh, so you might need glasses to read if the print is very small, or you might find it difficult in very low lit conditions to use that near vision uh, part with the multifocal lenses. They need to understand that. And again, as I said, the glares and halos may persist, and in a very small one in 20, stop driving. So that's important to understand at night, at night. During the day, they're fine. Um, and preoperative assessment, very important. In any patient with toric or multifocal lens, make sure that the dry eye is completely managed because you can get the wrong biometry on Pentacam. I always do look at refraction, Pentacam and biometry and make sure everything matches before moving forward. I don't do a psychological assessment, but just chatting to the patient, you can see are they a pragmatist or are they kind of a perfectionist? And if they're a perfectionist, I would avoid multifocal lens. Um, and consent. So write them a letter uh, after the consultation, make sure you've said everything. I often, with the multifocal lens, get them back again to make sure they've had all the questions answered, give them plenty of chair time. 
I can't stress that enough to make sure that they're happy with the choice that they're, they're making. And there are other options. So if they don't really want to risk the glare and the halo, well, you can go for monovision because actually you don't get that with monofocal lenses, but they lose that depth of perception. So if they are into model making, uh, then that might not be great. But if, if that kind of intermediate vision isn't so important and they just want to read and look far mainly, not doing much computer work, then that could be quite a good, good choice. EDOF lenses are quite good uh, because they have much better contrast sensitivity and much less glare and halo issues, uh, but they're not very good for near vision. So what you could do is, is you have both EDOF lenses in and leave your non-dominant eye slightly myopic. So you're kind of giving them mini monovision with EDOF lenses. So these are all the kind of things that you can kind of with, uh, that you can try with patients. And of course you can mix and match different things. There is multifocal lens questionnaires. So in those that I'm a bit worried that if they're not sure what they want to do, I kind of often give them that to just make them go through things, make them think about their activities and make them think if that's the way they want to go forward. And if um, all the uh, boxes are ticked, then we go forward and, and proceed. And, and with the multifocal lens also, I should mention, you want a perfect optical system. So you don't want to do it in patients who've got glaucoma where they might have reduced contrast sensitivity already or macular degeneration, where the lenses might not work quite well together. And you need to do it in both eyes. So uh, you're not gonna have one eye done and the other monofocal, it wouldn't really work there. So I just mentioned exclusions for multifocals, which is essentially ocular comorbidities, a very highly expecting, critical, demanding patient who's a perfectionist, uh, strong desire, never want to wear glasses, avoid those like the plague. Occupational hazards, if they drive a lot at night, that could be a problem. Anyone with really abnormal pentacam, so irregular stigmatism, you can get multifocal torics, which is fine, but if they've got early KC or irregular stigmatism, you want to obviously avoid them. Again, I would be very careful in patients with high degree of stigmatism because it's very difficult to get them bang on kind of um, zero and any residual stigmatism could reduce the function of the uh, multifocal and you might have an unhappy patient. Lower myops are not great because they're always used to very good near vision. And now suddenly you're kind of giving them good distance vision, but not so great near vision. So again, it's important to watch out for those. I think anyone who's had a complication, so if one eye is complicated, almost no point in thinking about doing a multifocal in the other eye. Um, anyone with previous refractive surgery who wants a multifocal lens, I tend to send to a corneal specialist, to be honest, because I think uh, those are super high risk and if they're unhappy, they can go. But if they've not had previous refractive surgery, more than happy to discuss multifocal lens with them. Um, and of course, anyone, as I mentioned, who's previously sued the fake cake with a monofocal lens. Very quickly, uh, I know we're kind of running out of time. Just want to talk to you about some future exciting changes that are happening in IOLs. So this is what we call the kind of light adjustable um, intraocular uh, lenses where the power changes with application of light. These lenses have something called macromers in them. And essentially once you've done the surgery and you see where the refraction is, if you want to achieve a bit more myopia or something like that, you can direct light beam, which would polymerize, uh, photopolymerize these macromers. And then that will allow the lens to change shape. And then once the lens has changed shape to what, what you want, you kind of irradiate the whole lens and that would lock it in. So that's kind of very exciting new technology. That's actually in, but is being kind of developed as we, as we speak. Um, I've got some other pictures here where you the kind of looking at silicon polymers. So you remove the lens and you fill the eye with this silicon polymer. So um, rather than an IOL, and it just uses the body's ability of ciliary muscle and zonules to restore or yeah, to achieve accommodation. Um, the Alenza lens, uh, when I was reading about it, it, sounded like science fiction. It still does, to be honest. But so this is uh, lenses using nano um, technology and artificial intelligence. And what these lenses do is that they change focal point depending on what you're doing. So if you're looking at far or when you're reading, the way your pupil reacts, the lens will know whether you're looking at a distant target or a near target. And so it will change the refractive power of the lens. I, I mean, I don't pretend for a second to understand how it works, but it's, it seems to work off the 
way the pupil constricts and the way your pupil constricts to light is different to the way it uh, constricts when you're accommodating. So amazing. And this is another example of an accommodative IOL which uses fluid to move in and out of the lens in order to change its refraction to achieve accommodation. So very exciting things um, happening. I wanted to finish off with you by talking about what we know here. Um, we want to be able to offer cataracts to all our patients. That's surely what you want to do in anyone who has significant cataract. Uh, but we are often bound by some sort of rationale. And every region is different. Um, I think we have a fair system because we don't go purely on visual acuity scores. In some places, you know, it's pure visual acuity score, 612 or worse. You know, patients with 6-9 vision who have really bad glare, uh, who, who could really do with cataract surgery. So uh, you've all seen the CAQ scores. Uh, I must say, pretty much all, all of us have been instructed to reject referral without a CAQ score. So this must accompany patient, they must reach uh, a level of 10. So um, the first bit is to give them a score with the, you know, the best corrected vision. For distant, you add in what they read with the binocular. Um, if there's posterior capsule opacity, you add five. Anyone with significant pathology. Now by significant pathology, you don't need a, a little bit of retinal pigment and field ch change, you know, take off half the points. We are talking, you know, good going macular degeneration, needing treatment, big atrophic scars, you know, copped looking discs, you know, those kind of things, then we would, we would expect you to, to kind of apply that. But then there's this section with severity of symptoms. So here they can certainly score points based on how badly this affects them in order to uh, be able to get their cataract. Um, and when you see the patient uh, for your post-op um, ass refractive assessment, um, you know, you do your bit and you send this in. The kind of things I would want to certainly know about is if they've got unexplained poor vision, so if the vision is worse than 612, when they've got no other ocular pathology and they should be doing well, that should be highlighted. And I certainly, uh, when I get that, get a scan straight away to make sure there's no macular edema, because by the time they come to you, around four weeks is when you start getting the Irvine gas syndrome. And I hope to God that they've had an OCT beforehand, because if the OCT is dry, then that pretty much makes the diagnosis. Refractive surprise. So. Uh, you guys, I'm not sure if you get the post-op um, letters, but certainly in our operative notes, it says clearly what the target refraction was. And we need 85% of our patients to be within plus or minus one dot of the target refraction. So anything more than that would be a refractive surprise and we would need to know. So we can look, check the biometry and see what's happened. Um, and then, you know, of course, anything within the clinical examination that you're not happy with. Is there corneal edema that hasn't gone? Really by four weeks it should have, so patient may have had underlying Fuchs. Uh, persistent uveitis, if they've still got inflammatory cells, if the pressure's high, they might need IOP lowering drops. Uh, those of you who are able to prescribe, this is a great opportunity for you to, to kind of be managing these. PCO is unusual at four weeks, but sometimes if the posterior capsular cataract is bang on the capsule and you can't manage it during the FACO, they might need laser treatment. Um, anyone with a dislocated IOL, hopefully you shouldn't be seeing any of that. Um, significant soft lens matter can cause inflammation. So again, anyone who has that might, uh, you might want to kind of uh, refer back. Well, you, you know, we would want to see anyway if that happens. Um, or anyone with posterior seg segment pathology. So is there a new floater? Please dilate them, have a good look to make sure there is no tear or retinal detachment. Or, or actually anyone who afterwards says, actually, I'm not happy with my surgical outcome, we would want to see and consult. Uh, my last slide really is about um, bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery, immediate bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery. And this has gained a bit of popularity uh, during COVID because we've been limited in the number of patients that we can get through the door. And uh, a lot of people within forums were talking about, well, now that they're in, you should do both eyes. I'm not a fan at the moment. I'm not saying I never will. In fact, I've done it three or four times. Um, young patients with Down syndrome who needed to have general anesthetic and you think do both eyes <clears throat> as you only give them one GA. But these uh, kind of patient people are, are kind of advocates of using this all, you know, in, in uh, routinely in, in their practice. So there are just certain things that you might want to know about that. First of all, the cataract should be indicated in both eyes. 
uh, any ocular or periocular disease should be managed prior to cataract surgery. Um, hopefully a surgeon should be very competent if they're doing both eyes um, in one setting. Uh, and um, the, they should be fully consented with pros and cons of having them done at the same time or having them delayed. And the, 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 the headache here is that you need to have a complete aseptic separation between first and second eye. So your instrument should be separate trays, uh, separate ster sterilization cycles. You should use different OVDs. Anything that could be a source of infection should be different. Otherwise, you are at the risk of having end of thymitis in both eyes, and that would be an absolute disaster. So be very, very careful. Now, as you know, those of you who work in my clinic, we do injections in both eyes, but you know, that's a time critical condition, very different to cataract surgery. And you need to have both eyes done um, at the same time in order to avoid losing sight. Um, and the other thing that I, I would kind of argue is that you often learn from the first eye. Did they like the anesthetic? Did they, were they allergic to the maxitrol you gave them? Were they, uh, you know, did they develop post-op macroedema? So the way you, you treat the other eye. So these are all very important uh, when you're doing it. But if you're going to do it, you must audit your work. So the, those who are in favor would say faster visual recovery of immediate bilateral uh, simultaneous cataract surgery, faster visual recovery, lower hospital cost, more efficient use of hospital, reduced cost of travel, less absence from work. And it's, as I said, gained a bit of traction during COVID, no anisometropia, and it's great for patients of GA um, or those with learning difficulty. And I have used it in that circumstance, but not in other, not in other situations. And um, problem with it, as I said, you can modify the second eye from the first eye. Uh, risk of bilateral endothamitis has been four described in the world from this. Uh, refractive surprise, so biometry issues. Uh, you, can't, you can't adjust the other eye. If your eyes end up minus two instead of zero, you could either go for monovision or you could make the other eye minus two to manage them together. But if you've done them at the same time, you can't. There's obviously that medical legal risk and everything else that I've explained that can go wrong. Um, and of course, if it's the first eye that you're doing and that has gone wrong, you must not do the second eye. Um, and in the last meeting, S European uh, Society of Cataract Refractive Surgeons, 70% uh, still were not doing it, although 19% uh, said that they would do it in exceptional circumstances. So, so actually that tells you that only 11% do it routinely. Um, and, you know, with COVID and cataract surgery, really what we've seen is six months, five months suspension of um, cataracts. Um, and that has obviously massively increased our current weight. At the moment, unfortunately, Eastbourne is out of action because it's been used as a COVID ward uh, for inpatients. So we, so we all kind of 50% capacity now, which is what's pushed the weight up. And there are issues with PPE staffing levels. We're very lucky where we are that we've got Bexhill Hospital to do these cataracts and we've got staff supporting it because actually there are few regions, quite a few regions where they're not doing cataracts at all. And what I'm noticing in my list is that there are more mature cataracts coming through, which obviously increases the risk. So um, it's, you know, we can't get back to normal soon enough just because we all need a bloody holiday, but at the same time, manage our services much better on the NHS that we are at the moment. Um, COVID related complications often present with dry eye conjunctivitis and watering, but there is this microangiopathy with vascular occlusions affecting the arteries and veins and the optic nerve uh, and inflammation that has been described. So, so kind of uh, be wary of that. I think I don't really need to do anything else just to say that Seiko is a non-AGP uh, on the local anesthetic. Um, so that's fine. Um, you, um, we, we've kind of taken a bit more surgery off the junior doctors and given it, the difficult ones are done by senior surgeons because if they need second surgery, you wanna avoid uh, kind of people having to have a second operation in this circumstance. Um, what we do at the moment is um, COVID question to patients before they're coming to the ward. Staff have all had their first jab, some have had two, and uh, they are, um, we do lateral flow tests twice a week. Um, and you know that's that's just protecting patients, protecting staff, really. Um, and 
yeah, the drape obviously minimizes the risk of any exhaled, hair, uh, exhaled air coming around. Um, and we use HPMC on the wound during FACO, which minimizes any kind of uh, risk of uh, scatter uh, from the anterior chamber. And we are not doing any general anesthetic or IV sedation at the moment for the FACOs. So these are kind of all the things we're doing at the moment to manage the risk. Now, there's a three minute video. Let me just uh, stop here. Uh, your share skin, uh, pause share. Okay. Oh. Ian, can you hear me? Let me just, yeah. Uh, Ian, have I got three minutes? Really interesting. So much uh, information there. That was fantastic. We have got a number of questions if you've yeah. got time to, um, to go through with them for us. So, on mature cataracts, do you try FACO? Or do you try the uh, cap extra capsular cataract extraction? Yeah, so a very good question. So extra cap is the old method of doing it where you open the cornea about 11 millimeters. Um, and really most mature cataracts you can get away with FACO. Um, in fact, the white cataracts are the easier ones because they crack more quickly and they tend to occur quite quickly. The ones that are really difficult are the really leathery brown cataracts. And if they've got a good cornea and you know you think you could get away with it, then I would always prefer FACO than ECI because ECI would be suturing, etc. The only time one would, the only time I've really kind of considered um, ECI is if, uh, God forbid, you're doing a cataract and halfway through, you know, there's a complication and you need to get the lens out and you don't want to disturb the vitreous, you could convert to an ECI. But I haven't had to do that um, for a very, very long time. Um, and there's other stuff you could do. So if you had a cataract that you thought uh, might, you might want to use ECI, you can go through the sclera, so sclera tunnel, or so small incision, uh, kind of you know using it with a small incision uh, yeah. that way. But yeah, I mean, I would I would say 99.99% of ECI. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So for a patient who's previously had LASIK, what formula do you use for IOL selection? Do you use a pentacam plot? Pentacamble. Pentacamble. Yeah. So, so, so what? So what I do? If somebody's had previous laser refractive surgery, what we do is we want to get as much information as possible. So my first question often is, have you got information? Uh, the ones that I've done recently, uh, none of them had information. Often, so I've done it thirty years ago. The place is closed now. I don't have any information, uh, and all I need to know from them is whether they long sighted or short sighted. Because actually, what you want is your biometry, your pentacam and the latest refraction, okay? And then the new generation formulas uh, will be, all you need to kind of mention in them is whether they were hyperopic or myopic before the laser. And you put the figures in that you have from your biometry and it will give you what lens you need to put in. And I would cross check that uh, with the American Society of Cataract Refractive Surgeon. They've got a, they've got kind of a formula uh, there and I would use uh, that to just double check and see whether the lenses are very similar and I go from there. So, so it is true that, so for example, we would use the, on, on the IOL master, we would use the Hagis L. So, it, and, and it is very important actually, because if you forget to press that button, um, so Hagis L you'd use kind of for, for the myopic patients. If you forget to use that button, uh, that they've had previous refractive surgery for myopia or hyperopia, the difference between the lens you would choose is in order of three or four diopters. So it will make a massive difference. It's very important that you ask the question, have you had laser refractive surgery? But then I do double check with the other formula as well to make sure that that is in fact correct. Excellent. And with the um, CA... Oh, can I say one more thing when I'm saying that? Yes. Well, that yeah. That's <clears throat> important for LASIK patients. If they've had RK, then that's different. There's a different formula you need to use. And you also have to be careful because you've got the radial keratotomy uh, line. So you need to go, uh, if you're doing FACO, you need to go between those lines and they are at risk of wound dehiscence. So they are much more high risk than lay sick patients. Um, but you know, at all times, you must have uh, pentacamp and biometry. Um, and the other thing I would mention to them is that if they end up with a bit of a refractive surprise, they might not then need. They, they might not then be able to have laser optimization because they've already had LASIK. So it's important that they understand that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you again. Um, so with the uh, CAQ form, do you think they should include a myopic shift score? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's very valid because I think that uh, it doesn't allow you. But uh, I th can you not refer if the anisometropia is more than two, or is that for the second eye? That's for the second eye, yeah. Yeah, that's perhaps something that I should take. That's a very good point. They should do. I mean, if they're becoming anisometropic, um, and yet with the best corrected vision, you're still able to get them six six, but the you know the eyes are three dots is different. They should. I think in that circumstance, to be honest, I would probably refer in explaining what the issue is um, and uh, put the CAQ score there, but clearly mark on the CAQ score that there's three diopters of anisometropia and most of us who would triage would pass that through. Yeah. It's just when a patient is referred for cataracts without CAQ score at all, yeah. and no explanation, the GP literally says, can you please consider cataract surgery? Here's the past history. No vision, no CAQ score. That will get rejected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Shah. Um, are toric lenses available under the NHS treatment? No, we don't. I know in some places they are, but at East Sussex, they're not. So if somebody has got, if somebody's got significant stigmatism and they need a toric lens, then they would need to have the whole thing private. It's a bit annoying because in certain countries like Canada, you could pay for the lens, but have you say on the NHS, on their NHS, um, and the surgeon make, you know, gets a little bit, the hospital gets a little bit, you buy the lens, but you don't pay. But in UK, it's a bit kind of all or nothing, unfortunately. So you either have to pay the whole process or not. And that's, and I, and I, and I, I hope one day NHS does change that because the patient should be able to just pay for the lens and, you know, achieve what they want but unfortunately we can't yeah lovely um what's the best management for a patient presenting with severe dry extensive superficial punctate staining a dry eye at post-op check so i i mean you go through your stepwise your step uh, process i mean most of the time the dry eye is because of the iodine so the iodine you know kills off all the good bugs if you like that are responsible for well, actually, the good bugs can cause the endophthalmitis, but <clears throat> these bugs are also important for tear film production and homeostasis. And um, as the iodine kills them all, it takes quite a long time before they grow back and the tear film goes back to normal. So it's just supportive. Mm -hmm. So treat blepharitis with, you know, blepharclean wipes. If there's any myvolmian gland disease, then you need to treat that as well accordingly uh, with hot compression, etc. Lubricants, preservative-free lubricants. Um, as much as they need it with gel at night. And that tends to sort most patients out. Lovely, thank you very much, Shah. If 612 or worst post-op, no ocular abnormalities, should we refer urgently or just note on the post-op form? No, I would note on the post-op form. I and mean, I think I would only refer urgently if you see something horrendous going on. Most of you guys have OCT, although you can't probably do the OCT, can you, as a post-op check, because I'm not sure if you get paid for it. So I think what you could do, <clears throat> if it's 612, they don't have any other ocular morbidity that you're aware of, uh, you would make a note saying, look, you know, vision is 612. We, we all see the post-op forms anyway. The first thing I would do is look on Medisoft and see if there is any reason why it is 612. And if it's not, I get a scan within a week. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say you send it has through. The only ones you'd want to refer urgently is if you see something that's very wrong, like very high pressure, significant inflammation, if, there is, if the IOL is dislocated, if you see lens, you know, lens fragment in the anterior chamber, things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What's the current views on monocular patients requiring cataract surgery? Uh, views? Well, I mean, if they need... Uh, I don't, sorry, so imagine if a patient's got just vision in one eye and no second eye to fall back on, would you count that as a higher oh, risk to do surgery? Yeah, 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 that's that's important because it's the only eye, obviously, the stakes are much higher. So that's why I say you treat the patient and not the eye. So you need to make them, you just go through everything and say, look, um, at the end of the day, this is your only eye. Uh, why do you want to have surgery? And if they are struggling, then you go ahead and do it. So if they if they can't drive, if they are saying if or if they've got another condition that you can't treat because the cataract is quite dense, then you balance the risk of and go, going ahead. But we do 
only eye surgeries all the time. And it's often reserved for consultants, to be fair. So it's very, we never give that to a trainee. Um, and, you know, I have a very long discussion with them to make sure that they know why they're having cataract surgery, because if they are that one in a thousand, you want to make sure that they had a good reason to having that operation. Thank you. I think the next question relates to what you said in your talk with the CAQ score. I think you said in your talk, the CAQ score has to be 10. I thought it had to be greater than 10. And the question is, does the CAQ have to be greater than 10 for referral? I thought it had to be 11. I might be wrong. Did you? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I always thought, well, I think it was 10 or above, but perhaps we can, we can, that and put it on the group. we can, we can, we can um, WhatsApp that to the group. Yeah, we can let them. I've know. certainly been accepting tens. <laughs> um, allied health professionals have taken over many of the doctors' roles. Do you think non-medics will carry out cataract surgery in the future? Um, well, uh, I think somebody. Tr I, I think to be honest, the main issue you would have with that would be from the profession. I'm ashamed to say. I think. For a lot of us, cataract surgery is like our only escape mm. from mundane clinics. I mean, I moved to Eastbourne because I wanted to have two operating lists. So if somebody told me that, right, you're not going to be doing any more cataracts, you're just going to be doing clinics, I think I might shoot myself. So, so I, think, I think, could they do it? Of course they could. I mean, you know, you, you, you've seen them do injections. I mean, it'll take a lot longer, obviously. And I think there was somebody in Manchester who was teaching a nurse and he got shot down very quickly because people were worried about losing that ability. So, um, you know, with Femto, with Femto now, the machine does half the work. So, so you need even less involvement um, from the surgeon. And I think as the machines develop, robots will take over actually. It's probably going to be more like that than allied healthcare professionals. I think it, it, the whole thing will go robotic at some point. Yeah. So I just hope to, uh, to finish my career before that happens. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, um, the last question, well, it's a uh, thank you, brilliant yeah, lecture. Yeah, I was wondering how we receive our CET points. Will you be needing our names and GOC numbers? Um, if you're watching this, I'm sure you've registered via the link. And when you um, registered, you had to put your name and your GOC number into there. So I will this weekend print out the list and I will enter everybody onto the GOC website who has watched this uh, webinar live tonight. So you don't need to do anything, but as long as you've registered and you've supplied your GOC number, I will upload the GO your CT points but, automatically. Can I add one more thing? Um, <laughs> when you are saving this on, well, when Sarah is saving this on YouTube for you, <laughs> can, can you please make sure that, I wouldn't put the contract video up, just, just in case, I just don't want to come back from that. Yeah. But what I do have, and it's taken me a year, is that I've got, um, I've asked somebody to do an animation for me for cataract surgery to explain to patients. Mm -hmm. so when that is, uh, hopefully should be ready in the next month. He's finally finishing it off. When that, is, I'll put the link on the group and if anyone wants to use it to just show patients what happens. He's done a, he's done a very good job, but it's just taken him a year to do it. But yeah, I think just have everything barring the surgery itself, please. Yep, I will <laughs> delete that from the video. But okay. so thank you very much, Shah, for, for that talk. That's been a fantastic, um, thoroughly uh, enjoyable, lots of information there. As I've mentioned, I will aim to get the CET uploaded. I think there is one more question that's just come through, if you've got time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, really informative. Please do another on uveitis. Um, you've done two on uveitis, haven't you? So uh, yeah, your popular. You can never have enough. You can never have enough uveitis. That's fine. I can. Um, I can rehash. Those ones are not too difficult when you're having. You, when when you can rehash a talk, that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just when you're doing a talk from beginning, it takes absolute ages. But you know, it's it's been. You know, I I, I like cataracts, so it's been fun doing the talk. But that's fine. Lovely. So the next one is going to be your good lady. Going to be a good lady, Sarah, doing a BV uh, webinar, and that will be beginning of April. But I will advertise on the group when that is. So. Fantastic. Thank you to everyone for watching tonight and thank you very much for your time for writing the webinar and, and giving up your time tonight, Shah. Well, thank you for supporting everything. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.